We do appreciate having each of you with us today, those of you who are visiting. So I don't believe I see any really new faces, but uh, we appreciate all of you coming and being with us. And we hope that you will have opportunities to come and be with us again. We have a number of our people, as we mentioned earlier, that are gone. This being a rather long weekend, and then taking advantage of that to get away. I'm very glad that you're here, though. Last week, we talked about the idea behind giving, taken primarily from the Old Testament, and observed the fact that some four or five hundred years, actually, before the giving of the Law of Moses, the individuals at that time were already tithing. The purpose in my lessons on this is not because of the idea that we need to give more money or anything of that nature. It's just that in studying this topic, you discover that giving is actually one of the most uh, plentifully spoken about subjects in the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament. There are some uh, nearly 200 references to giving in the New, giving in the New Testament alone. And because of this, and it being mentioned more than prayer or the baptism or the Lord's Supper or any of these things, uh, and yet it's something that we very seldom ever speak about. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that in many instances, individuals get very upset when you start talking about money. <clears throat> we get the sound right in a minute. The reality is that as we observed last week, we're really not talking about the total number of dollars or cents that an individual is to contribute. The indications from the scriptures are that it's more on a percentage basis. And, of course, we understand that as we've prospered, and we have the example of Jesus speaking of the widow who cast in all she had, and yet in our money it was a tenth of a cent. And yet she gave more than all of those that were putting in much larger sums. So what we have to accept and recognize about the giving process as far as God is concerned is, is giving is really for our benefit, not for his. It's his anyway. It all belongs to him. And somehow or other people tend to believe that the church will go out of existence if people don't give. <clears throat> not the case. The church is going to be here when Christ returns. So we don't need to be concerned about that. But what I am concerned about is the fact that if you always have a desire for more, there's a good possibility that you're on dangerous ground. And looking at scriptures from Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and verse 5, don't love money. Be happy with what you have because God has said, I will never abandon you or leave you. Part of the problem with giving is a lack of trust in God. We get so wound up in the things that are going on in the world and all of the different kind of things that are taking place there that we somehow or other feel like, uh, where is God in all of this? And does he really take care of us? And we never really stop to take the time to just stop and think about it, where we are right now and what we have. I appreciate Terry mentioning the being thankful for what we do have in this building even. And the reality is, when you think about this, how many of us today don't know where our next meal is coming from? Are you honestly sitting here and you have absolute doubts about whether or not you're going to have lunch or not? And I would hazard a guess that there is no one here that qualifies for that. Also, uh, we have no doubts about how we're going to get away from here where we're going to go, and things of that nature, basically. So the reality is, is what we discover is that, as the scriptures tell us, God has said, I will never abandon you. I will be there. In the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verse 10, whoever loves money will never be satisfied with money. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with more income. Even this is pointless. I can tell you from personal experience with individuals who had more money than they would ever be able to spend in this lifetime that the reality when they are asked 
how much money do you need? The answer is always more, which is precisely what this passage of scripture says. Individuals who have money and have that as their goal in life will never have enough. No matter how much you have, it will never be enough. And the reality is that you'll never be satisfactory. You will never be satisfied because it would always, I need more. I need more. And if you stop and think about our lives, a lot of what goes on in our lives is this quest for more. God has promised us that he will provide us with what we need. But the problem that we have is, is that we want more. And so we go beyond the idea of just having what we need. And we are constantly in this driving mode of having more. If I've got this particular model automobile, then I need to step up to another, a higher quality automobile or a more expensive automobile. If I've got a house like this, I need a bigger house. I need all of these kinds of things. And we go on and on and on and on with these. And we never fail, we never seem to recognize in our lives that what our, we are wanting is more. And that is precisely the opposite of what we really need to be thinking about. Paul in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, part of which was read to you this morning, we didn't bring anything into the world and we can't take anything out of it. The old expression we've used a lot of times is, did you ever see a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse? Nobody's taking anything with them. You're leaving everything that you have right here. And I don't care how many millions or billions of dollars that you accumulate, how many houses you have, cars, clothes, shoes, whatever it is that lights up your life, you're going to leave every bit of it right here. It's not going with you. And so to devote your life to this is what Ecclesiastes 5.15 talks about. They came from their mother's womb naked. They will leave as naked as they came. They won't even be able to take a handful of their earnings with them from all their hard work. So I don't care if you work your fingers to the bone, daylight to dark, seven days a week, hammer and tongs the whole way, cheap, steal, whatever you can to make money, you're going to leave every cent of it right here. So what is the real purpose in trying to achieve it? How many pairs of shoes can you wear at one time? How many cars can you drive? How many houses can you live in? Uh, all of these things are, are really of what great value are they? Other than the fact that we, we're just trying to satisfy that desire for more. I, I just want more. But if you look at uh, John the third chapter in verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, he will see the God's constant anger. So what is really important? It seems to me like maybe God's Son is what's important. And maybe it's important that we listen to the, some of the things that the Scriptures teach us about Him and about the way in which we're to live our lives. In, in Revelation 14, we are told there about what it is that we can take with us. But think about the minutes for what we're going to leave behind, though. Since we talked about leaving behind, all your worldly goods, we recognize that, all that's going to be left behind. But what about your reputation? Are you going to leave that behind? Afraid so. And that reputation can be one of several different qualities. It can be a reputation for someone that has made a good life, that has lived for the Lord, that has done the things that God would expect of them, and has set an example before everyone they came in contact with of what a real believer in Christ, a real Christian, should be. And by the same token, that reputation can be one for folly, foolishness, a wasted opportunities, and neglect of all of the things important, family, whatever. And every one of us knows people that qualify in both directions. So that's something we need to think about because you're going to leave that here too. And people won't necessarily, they might remember you had a lot of money, but they will remember the kind of person you are or have been far longer than that. I worked for a man who became a billionaire. 
He was one that always wanted more. And he lost his life because he wanted to take something that he had given to another man away from him that didn't really amount to a few thousand dollars and he was killed for it. Now, what, what possible reasoning and intelligence can there be behind sacrificing your life for something that you could have a thousand times over just because of the fact that you went back on your word? Makes no sense. Influence. You are going to influence people. There will be at least nine people in this world that will be influenced by the life that you have lived for good or for evil, for good or bad. That's the reality of it. Minimum of nine people's lives are going to be affected by the way you live. And you're going to leave that here. You're not going to be able to take that with you. So when you think about things that you're going to leave behind, that's something to consider. But then Revelation 14, 13 tells us what we can take with us. And surprisingly enough, you can take something with you. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, from now on those who die believing in the Lord are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their hard work. What they have done goes with them. So the work that you have done for the Lord, you take that with you. That's the one thing that you can take with you. Because the reality is that is the one thing that truly belongs to you. Out of everything that has existed in this life, that is the one thing that no one else gave you. That is what you have done, and that's what you take with you. And that's what we need to keep in mind, is that that's what we're contributing to. That's what we're adding to by our lives. And if dollars and cents gets in the way, it's, it's a... It's a total waste because we get nothing in return. In 1 Timothy 6, 8, as long as we have food and clothes, we should be satisfied. Now, when you study this in the Greek, you find that it's entirely different what it's really expressing here. And it's unfortunate that when it's translated many times, the individuals that translate it uh, just translate the words and go on from there and don't really dig into the actual meaning of it. When you study this particular passage out, what you find is that Paul is saying that what you have in life, what is provided for you, the food that you have, the place to stay, the clothes that you wear, the car that you drive, whatever you need in this life is, should be satisfactory to you. You should be satisfied with what you have. In other words, uh, Paul said he became all things to all men that he might not all means reach some. In other words, he's saying that whatever the need was, he was willing to meet it. And he talks about that in, in many other things. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in 612 says, or 632, everyone is concerned about these things and your heavenly Father certainly knows you need all of them. God knows what you need. He knows exactly. He's known since before you existed what you were going to need. And yet, here we are, so concerned about what we have and that somehow or other we might miss a meal or something might go wrong or we might not have this or we might not have that. And yet, like I said, when you look at your life, what is it that you need that you really don't have? Oh, you say, well, I, I, need, I, want, I need this. Well, do you really need it? Or is it just something that you want? Because when you spend your life wanting more, like the scripture said from old, you'll never be satisfied. You will never have enough. No matter how much you have, it will never be enough. It will, there will always be something better. It will be a better washing machine or it will be a, a better dryer or whatever. It doesn't make any difference what it is. It, there will always be something more that's better in your eyes. I was telling Becky yesterday, one of the things I wish I could take, have taken a picture of was a cow standing in a pasture with the best grass you ever saw clear up to the cow's belly with its head stuck through a barbed wire fence eating the bahia grass that the state plants on the side of the road. 
And that's exactly the same way we go. You know, we can have the very best right there for us, but we've got to have whatever's on the other side of the fence. Because somehow or other, if there's a fence there, that means that what's there is better. It just really and truly, it doesn't make any sense. Matthew 6, 25, more of the Sermon on the Mount. So I tell you to stop worrying about what you will eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Isn't your life more than just dollars and cents? And working yourself to a complete frazzle, trying to get more and more and more of whatever the world has to offer. How much do you have to have? You have to have enough to meet the needs that you have. You can only eat so much. Most of us eat far more than we should. But the reality is, is that you don't need as much as you normally eat. You'd be surprised how little you can actually get by on if you really set your mind to it or if necessity demands it. So as we stop and think and we look at these things and we think about them, how are, how are we going to uh, go through life and, and have any contentment or satisfaction at all if the only thing we can desire is is just more. I, I just somehow I, I lay awake at night trying to figure out how I can get more. Uh, if that's the way you think, I feel sorry for you because it's a miserable existence. We need to get away from that kind of thinking process. Paul in 1 Timothy 6.17 Tell those who have the riches of this world not to be arrogant and not to place their confidence in anything as uncertain as riches. Instead, they should place their confidence in God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Look around you at the world we live in. We've polluted it up pretty good and done a lot of things just like that. But in spite of all the damage that we can do to it, it's still a beautiful place. It's still as... When you really look and think about it, you know, there, there really isn't anything that you can really compare it to. And yet we seldom see those things. We, 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 we just overlook that. We, we overlook the, the beauty that God has placed around us. And we're still, we're looking for something else. There's got to be something else that, that's more important. And those that have money need to think that it's something very special that makes them better than others. But that, of course, is the world's approach. Normally, those that have an abundance of wealth are arrogant. They, they think they're better than other people because of that and because of the power it gives them in all of this, which is the world's approach. But uh, it really doesn't make any difference because ultimately the day is coming and all of that is gone. It's all, it all passes away. In Philippians 4.12, I know how to live in poverty or prosperity. No matter what the situation, I've learned the secret of how to live when I'm full or when I'm hungry, when I have too much or when I have too little. That was Paul. And there were times that he went both ways. Times when he had more than he needed and times when he didn't have as much as he needed. But he says, he learned to live with that. And that's what we need to do. We need to learn to live our lives, to be content with what we have and satisfied with it, and not always be on the search for something else, something better. Uh, of course, if you succumb to the advertising processes of today, you'll be convinced that whatever you have is inferior to whatever is out there and available to you today. And like I said, uh, Every year we change our automobiles around and the bottom line though is when it gets so it thinks for you, backs up, parks and does all those kind of things for you, uh, the reality is what can it do for you? It can take you from here to there. And the Model A Ford that I had would do exactly the same thing and it was simplicity itself. But it would get me wherever I wanted to go, not as fast, not as comfortable and all of that. But it would get me there. And that in reality is all the fanciest one. You can buy a handmade Rolls Royce and the only thing it'll do is take you from one place to another. So we get all carried away with the idea that somehow or other if, they, if we have to pay a lot for it, it must be better than something else. Well, not necessarily so. 
And so we need to learn how to live with what we have. Be content with that. And that doesn't mean just giving up and quit trying and all of that. Yes, we can try. We need to do whatever we do, whatever we put our hands to, we need to do the very best job we have, can. And the reality is if you do that, if you treat the Lord right, you will discover that he will take care of you and do what's right. I'm going to throw a story in here, a personal experience that I debated about whether to mention or not. Most of you uh, knew my first wife, Carol. For the last 10 years of her life, she was uh, in very difficult problems. She was in pain constantly with major difficulties. We have very good insurance. We had Medicare, had TRICARE for Life. TRICARE for Life uh, ensured that whatever medical bills we had were paid in full, which was great. TRICARE uh, has a program called Express Scripts, which supplies the medication. It supplied most of the medication that we needed, and some of it uh, at a very reasonable price, some it didn't supply. But for that 10 years, I spent in the neighborhood of at least $900 to $1,000 a month for medication that the, would not be paid for by any insurance company for 10 years. And it, it was always a matter of, can we afford the medicine? But I can tell you this, she never missed her medication even once in 10 years because we couldn't get it. The Lord provided a way to have what was needed for as long as she lived. So we need to learn to live with what we have and recognize that uh, things work out. There were a lot of things, there's still some bumps in the road that are resolved, <coughs> but it's being taken care of and the Lord is providing ways to handle it. And so we, we recognize in all of that, whether we're in poverty or in prosperity, God takes care of us. He provides ways for us to succeed in what we undertake to do. Hebrews 13, 5, that we read originally, don't love money. Be happy with what you have because God has said, I will never abandon you or leave you. Be satisfied with what you have. When you have work to do, do the very best that you can. Be, be the best at what you do, but not because you expect it to make you a multi-millionaire, but because that's what God wants you to do. And if you leave that to him, he'll take care of the rest. He'll provide the way. Might not be the way that you would prefer or anything of that nature, but he will take care of you because he's promised you and he'll do it. What we need to learn to do is to trust him and believe what he says. 1 Timothy 3, verse 3, he must not drink excessively or be a violent person, but he must be gentle. He must not be quarrelsome or love money. And everybody will immediately say, well, that's the qualification for an elder. That's right. And what makes an elder different than a Christian? Not much that I can think of, because the reality is, except for a couple of things, the qualification for an elder is the qualification for being a Christian. So these are two things that we need to recognize that need to also be part of our lives. Not quarrelsome and not love money. Hebrews 13, 6. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? What can the world really do to you? The world can give you something that you would not even imagine. It can take your life away from you. And what can it do for the Christian? It can send you to eternity for something that is so much better than this world that you can't even imagine it. So what can the world really do to you? Besides, if you live for the Lord, it's just the world is just going to send you on to something far better. So the world can't really, in reality, hurt you at all. But then we have Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who is there to fear? The Lord is my life's fortress. Who is there to be afraid of? Who do we really have to fear? I think probably we need to be more afraid of ourselves than anything else. 
because of the desires and the appetites that we have and that we have to be constantly fighting against in order to overcome. But Paul explained this in Romans 7, verse 7. What should we say then? Are Moses' laws sinful? That's unthinkable. In fact, I wouldn't have recognized sin if those laws hadn't shown it to me. For example, I wouldn't have known that some desires are sinful if Moses' teachings has said, never have wrong desires. We can have wrong desires. And we've already talked about that. Desiring more and more and more. And the bottom line of that is that the Greek word that's involved in this is the word covet or covetousness. covetousness. And what that word is translated part of the time as is, is translated as sin. And there's a reason. And the reason is very simple. Because when we're talking about coveting, we're talking about desire. And desire is what leads to sin probably more than almost anything else. Where this desire for more actually becomes sin. And we never think about that. And it's seldom preached on because most people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that the driving force in their life is sin. But that's what it is. And that's the reality of it. And that's what we need to be aware of and considering. And as Paul said in his letters, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because that's what the word says. In Colossians, the third chapter, and verse 5, Therefore, put to death whatever is worldly in you, your sexual sin, perversion, passion, lust, and greed, which is the same thing as worshiping wealth. And the word there that is put in there for greed is covet, covetousness. And so what Paul is saying is, notice, notice the, the bedfellow, so to speak, of covetousness. Sexual sin, perversion, passion and lust all of those coupled with the desire for more so as I said at the first if your desire is more it's possible you're on dangerous ground because if that's the driving force in your life you need to reconsider what's driving you because the reality is is that God sees it as sin in Galatians 5 and verse 24, finally, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their corrupt nature along with its passions and desires. And so that says very simply something, that if we are really Christians, we have crucified or put away those desires and those drives that lead us in that direction. And that's what we've got to do. That's part of what it takes to be a Christian. You've got to get a grip on that and you've got to deal with it and you've got to take it out of your life. Because if you leave it there, it'll destroy you. There's no satisfaction in wealth. No matter how much you have, it will never be enough. If that's your goal, you will never have enough of it. And if we cannot trust God, we will never be content. You, the only place that you will find contentment in this life is to, is to accept God and what he has provided for you and recognize that he cares for you and that he will take care of you. And when you do that, you can have contentment. And wanting more money in particular is sin. Just wanting it to have more. You don't really need it. Just want more. Just want a bigger bank account. Want to have more gold in your IRA or your whatever, or, or gold in your closet or your safe or whatever, you know, having a desire for more and more and more of this and that, that's just contrary to what God would have us to be. And as the final passage we read says, the only answer to all of this is letting Christ be all in your life. Listen to him, listen to his words, and live as he would have you to. And when you do that, you can be satisfied with this life. You can have happiness beyond anything you would imagine. And you will have everything that you need. You will have some bumps in the road. There will be some disappointments. There will be some sadness and all of that. But that's life. And no matter 
how many multiple billions you have, you will have those still. Money won't take them away. And when you come to the end of this life, all of the money you have and all of the gold and the silver and the cars and the houses and all of that put together won't buy you one more heartbeat or one more breath. So we need to think very carefully about our relationship with the Lord and letting him be everything for us and guide us and help us in what we undertake to do. Today we offer an invitation. If you've never become a member of the body of Christ, then you need to take advantage of that. And if you are a Christian and you need prayers on your behalf, James 5 tells us that we would pray for you. And you need to realize, though, that the decision that you're about to make might very well be the last opportunity you have. But you need to think about that. And if you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. <laughs>